early marriage discusses love marriages how they can be made and the duty of parents in respect to them i have shown how economic forces in our society make for later and later marriage and at the present time economic forces are so overwhelming that all other forces are hardly worth mentioning in comparison you are let us say the mother of a boy of eighteen and you have what you call common sense meaning thereby a grasp of the money facts of life if your darling boy of eighteen should come to you with a grave face and announce mother dear i have met a girl i love and we have decided that we want to get married you would consider that the most absurd thing you had ever heard in all your born days and you would tell the lad that he was a baby and to run along and play if he persisted in his crazy notion you and your husband and all the brothers and sisters and relatives and friends both of the boy and the girl would set to work by scolding and ridiculing to make life a misery for them and ninety-nine times out of a hundred you would break down the young couple's marital intention but now let us try another supposition let us suppose that your darling boy of eighteen should come to you again and say mother dear some of the boys are going to spend this evening in a brothel and i have decided to go along would you think that was the most absurd thing you had ever heard in all your born days or would you answer yes of course my boy that is what i had in mind when i made you give up the girl you loved no you would not answer that but here is the vital fact it does not matter what you would answer for you would never have a chance to answer when a mother's darling wants to get married he comes and asks his mother's blessing but never does a mother's darling ask the blessing before he goes with the other boys to a brothel he just goes and maybe he borrows the money from some other fellow and the next day tells you he went to the theatre or maybe he picks up some poor man's daughter on the street and takes her into the park or up on the roof of a tenement some such thing he does to find satisfaction for an instinct which you in your worldly wisdom or your heavenly piety spurn and ridicule i do not wish to exaggerate if you are an exceptionally wise and tactful mother you may keep the confidence of your boy and guide him day by day through his temptations and miseries and keep him chaste but the more you try that the more apt you will be to come to my conclusion that late marriage is a crime against the race the more aware you will be of the danger either that his boy friends may break him down or that some lewd woman may come to his bedroom in the night-time never will you be able to be quite sure that he is not lying to you because of his shame and the pain he cannot bear to inflict upon you never will you be quite sure that he is not hiding some cruel disease sneaking off to some quack who takes his money and leaves him worse than before until finally he shoots off his head as happened to a nephew of an old and dear friend of mine such is the problem of the mother of a son and now what about the mother of a daughter this seems much simpler because your daughter is not generally troubled with sex cravings and if you teach her the proprieties and see that she is carefully chaperoned you may reasonably hope that she will be chaste but some day you expect that she will marry and then comes your problem if you are the usual mother you are looking for someone who can maintain her in the state of life to which she is accustomed if a fairy prince would come along or a plaster saint you would be pleased but failing that you will take a successful businessman one who has made his way in the world and secured himself a position but turn back to the figures i gave you a while ago if this man is thirty years of age there is at least a fifty-fifty chance that he has had some venereal disease and while the doctors claim to cure these diseases absolutely we must bear in mind that doctors are human and sometimes claim more than they perform every doctor will admit if you pin him down 
that these diseases burrow deeply into the tissues and many times are supposed to be cured when they are only hidden here is in a nutshell the problem of the mother of a daughter if you marry your daughter at seventeen to a lad of her own age you have a very good chance of marrying her to a person who is chaste if you marry her to a man of twenty-five you have perhaps one chance in a hundred if you marry her to a man of thirty-five you have perhaps one chance in ten thousand you may not like these facts i do not like them myself but i have learned that facts are none the less facts on that account you know the average society bud of eighteen and her attitude to a boy of the same age she regards him as a child and you think perhaps that it is natural for a girl to be interested in men of thirty-five or even forty-five but i tell you that it is not natural it is simply one of the perversions of pecuniary sex the girl is interested in such men because all her young life she has been carefully coached for the marriage market because she is dressed for it and solemnly brought out and introduced to other players of this exciting game of marriage for money with its incredible prizes of automobiles and jewels and palaces full of servants and magic checkbooks that never grow empty but suppose that instead of regarding her as a prize in a lottery you let her grow up naturally and taught her the truth about herself both body and mind and suppose that instead of dressing her in ways deliberately contrived to emphasize her sex you put her in a simple uniform and taught her to be honest and straightforward instead of mincing and coy suppose she played athletic games with boys of her own age and invited them to her home not for jazz dancing and stuffing cake and candy but for the sharing of good music and literature and art don't you think that maybe this girl might become interested in a lad of her own age and choose him with some understanding of his real self you take it for granted that young people should not marry until they can afford it but stop and consider is not this a relic of the old days always it takes time and deliberate effort of the reason to adjust our conventions to new facts so face this fact marriage today does not necessarily mean children it may just mean love it involves little more expense because the young people need cost no more together than they cost in the separate homes of their parents if they are children of the poor they are already taking care of themselves if they are the children of the moderately well-off their parents expect to support them while they are getting an education and why can they not just as well live together and the parents of each contribute their share let the parents of the boy give him not merely what it costs to keep him at home but also the sums which otherwise a boy would pay to the brothels by this argument i do not mean that i favor keeping young people financially dependent upon their parents my own son is working his own way through college and i should be glad to see every young man doing the same all that i am saying is that if parents are going to support their children while they are getting an education they might just as well support them married as single instead of penalizing matrimony by making all allowances cease at that point i know a certain ardent feminist who is all for late marriage for women and abhors my ideas on this subject she wants women to get a chance to develop their personalities whereas i want to sacrifice them to the frantic exigencies of the male animal young things of seventeen and eighteen have no idea what they are or what they want from life the mating impulse is a blind frenzy in them and they must be taught to control it just as they are taught not to kill when they are angry in the first place i point out that young ladies in colleges and in ballrooms give a lot of time and thought to sex even though they do not call it by that inelegant term 
I very much question whether, if we should apply our wisdom to the task of getting our young people happily mated before we sent them off to college, we should not get a lot more serious study out of them than we do now, with all their fussing and flirting and dancing. Second, I am willing to make heroic moral efforts where I see any chance of adequate results. But I have examined the facts and definitely made up my mind that it is not worthwhile, in our present stage of culture, to preach to the mass of men the doctrine that they should abstain from sex experience until they are twenty-five or thirty years of age. You may storm at them, but they only laugh at you. You may pass laws and try to put them in jail, but you only provide a harvest for blackmailers and grafters. As to sacrificing a girl, my answer is simply that I believe in love, and in this I think the girl will agree with me, if you will let her. I have never heard any qualified person maintain that it hurts a girl to respond to love at the age of seventeen or eighteen, nor do I think that it hurts a boy, provided that he is taught the virtues of moderation and self-restraint. Without these, it will hurt him to eat, but that is no argument for starving him. As for the question of his maturity and power to judge, we are able at present to keep him from marrying anybody. So I think we might reasonably hope to keep him from marrying a wanton or a slut. Certainly we might find somebody better than the peroxide blonde he now picks up at the front of the moving picture palace. The question at what ages we shall advise our young people to have children, is a separate one, depending upon many circumstances. First, of course, they should not have any until they are able financially to maintain them. As to the age at which it is physically advisable, that is a question to be settled by the physicians and the physiologists. I myself had the idea that the proper age would be when the woman had attained her full stature. But my friend Dr. William J. Robinson sends me some statistics from the Johns Hopkins Hospital Bulletin, which startled me. This publication for January 1922 gives the results in 500 childbirths, in which the mother's age was from 12 to 16 years inclusive. It appears that pregnancy and labor at these ages are no more dangerous than in older women. But on the other hand, the duration of the labor is actually shorter, and the size of the children is not inferior. These facts are so contrary to the general impression that I content myself with calling attention to them, and leave the commenting to be done by feminists and others who oppose themselves to the idea of early marriage. End of chapter 40 Chapter 41 The Marriage Club Discusses how parents and elders may help the young to avoid unhappy marriages. I will make the assumption that you would like to have a trial of my cure for prostitution. You would like to do something right here and now, without waiting for this social revolution. Very well. I propose that you shall find a few other parents of boys and girls who are in revolt against our system of hidden vice, and that you will meet and form a modern marriage club. Only you won't call it that, of course. You will tactfully describe it as a literary society, or a social circle, or an Epworth League, the parents who run it will know what it is for, just as they do today, the only difference being that it will exist to promote love matches instead of money matches. It happens that I am myself a tactless sort of a person, not skillful at avoiding saying what I mean. So in this chapter I shall content myself with setting forth exactly what this marriage club will do, and leaving it to more clever people to supply the necessary camouflage. This club will begin by correcting the most stupid of all our educational blunders, the assumption of the necessary immaturity of the young. Our young people nowadays have ten times as much chance to learn and ten times as much stimulus to learn as we had, 
and it is a generally safe assumption that they know much more than we think they do, and are ready to learn every sensible and interesting thing. I am carrying on an epistolary acquaintance with a little miss of twelve, who has read half a dozen of my books, among the worst of them, and writes me letters of grave appreciation. I have talked on socialism to a thousand school children and had them question me for an hour, and heard just as worthwhile questions as I have heard from an audience of bankers. Never in my life have I talked about real things with children that I did not find them proud to be treated seriously, and eager to show that they were worthy of that honor. A great part of our foolishness with children is due to the emptiness of our own heads. These parents will delegate one man and one woman to make a thorough study of the sex education of the young. Of course, there is knowledge about sex which has to be given to the very youngest child, and more and more must be given as they grow older and ask more questions. But what I have in mind here is that detailed and precise knowledge which must be given to the young when they approach the period of puberty. At this age of fourteen or fifteen, the man will take each of the boys apart, and the woman will take each of the girls, and will explain to them what they need to know. This duty will not be trusted to parents, for parents have an imbecile fear of talking straight to their children and try to get by with rubbish about bees and flowers. Let every child know that the days of the hole-and-corner sex business is forever past, and that here is an instructed person who talks real American and knows what he is talking about, and will deal with facts instead of with evasions. This club will help to educate the youngsters and also to give them a good time developing both their minds and bodies and learning to know them thoroughly when they are sixteen each one will have another talk this time about marriage and what it means learning that it is not merely flirtations and delicious thrills but a business partnership and the deepest and best of all friendships so when john finds that he likes mary best of all the girls he knows this won't be a subject for kidding and sly innuendo and blushes and simpering on mary's part but an occasion for decent and sensible talk about what each of them really is and what each thinks the other to be if they think they are in love then there will be a council of the elder statesmen to consider that case and what are the chances of happiness in that love this may sound forbidding but it is actually what is done at present, only it is not done honestly and frankly, and therefore does not carry proper weight with the young people. I am an opponent of long engagements, but I am also an opponent of no engagements at all. I know no truer proverb than, Marry in haste and repent at leisure. It would be my idea that a very young couple should announce their engagement, and then wait six months, and be consulted again about the matter, and have a chance to withdraw with no hard feelings, if either party thought best. If they wished to go on, they might be asked to wait another six months, if their elders felt very certain there were reasons to doubt the wisdom of the match. There are, of course, people who, because of disease or physical defect, should never be allowed to marry, and others who might marry, but should not be allowed to have children. There should be laws providing for such cases requiring physical examination before marriage, and in extreme cases providing for a simple and harmless surgical operation to prevent the hopelessly unfit from passing on their defects to the future but dealing for the moment with normal young persons members of our modern marriage club i should say that if after they have listened to the warning of their elders and have waited for a decent interval to think things over they still remain of the opinion that they can make a successful marriage then it is up to the elders to wish them luck i have known of young couples who have refused to heed warnings 
and regretted it. But I have known of others who went ahead and had their own way and proved they were right. There is a form of wisdom called experience, and there is another form called love. I hear the worldly and cynical rail at the blindness of young love, and I can see the truth in what they say, but also I can see the deeper truth in the magic dreams of the young soul. Here is a youth who adores a girl, and you know the girl, and it is comical to you because you know she is not any of the things the youth imagines. But who are you that claim to know the last thing about a human soul? Look into your own and see how many different things you are. Look back, if you can, to the time when you were young, and remember the visions and hopes. They have lost all reality to you now, but who could say how many of them you might have made real if there had been one other person who believed in them and loved them and would not give them up? I write this, and then I think of the other side, the fools that I have known in love, the trusting women, marrying rotten men to reform them, the pitiful people who think that fine phrases and sentimentality can take place of facts. I implore my young couples to sit down and face the realities of their own natures, to decide what they are and what they want to be, and if there is going to be any change, let it be made and tried out before marriage. I implore them to begin now to control their desires by their reason and judgment, to begin each of them at the very outset, to carry their share of the burdens and do their share of the hard work. I implore them to value independence and self-reliance in the other, and never, above all things, to marry from pity, which is a worthy emotion in its place, but has nothing to do with sex which should be an affair between equals, a matter of partnership and not of parasitism. I think that, on the whole, the most dreadful thing in love is the use of it for praying, for the securing of favors and advantages of any sort, whether by men or by women. End of chapter 41 Chapter 42 Education for Marriage Maintains that the art of love can be taught, and that we have the right and duty to teach it. I assume now that our young couple have definitely made up their minds, and that the wedding day is near. They are therefore, both the man and the woman, in position to receive information as to the physical aspects of their future experience. This information is now, for the most part, possessed only by pathologists, who impart it too late, after people have blundered and wrecked their lives. The opponents of birth control ask in horror if you would teach it to the young. I am now able to answer just when I would teach it. I would teach it to these young couples about to marry. I would make it by law compulsory for every young couple to attend a school of marriage, and to learn not merely the regulation of conception, but the whole art of health and happiness in sex. Perhaps the words, a school of marriage, strike you as funny. When I was young, I remember that Pulitzer founded a school of journalism, and all newspaper editors made merry. They knew that journalism could only be learned in practice. But nowadays, every city editor gives preference to an applicant who has taken a college course in reporting. They have learned that journalism can be taught, just like engineering and accounting. In the same way, I assert that marriage can be taught, and the art of love, physical, mental, moral, and even financial. I think that the day will come when enlightened parents would no more dream of trusting their tender young daughter to a man who had not taken a course in sex than they would go up in an aeroplane with a pilot who knew nothing about an engine. The knowledge which I possess upon the art of love I would be glad to give you in this book, but Unfortunately, if I were to do so, 
my book would be suppressed, and I should be sent to jail. Some ten or twelve years ago I received a pitiful letter from a man who was in state's prison in Delaware, charged with having imparted information as to birth control. Under our amiable legal system a perfectly innocent man may be thrown into jail and kept there for a year or two before he is tried, and, if he is without money or friends, he might as well be buried alive. I went to Wilmington to call on the United States attorney who had caused the indictment in this case, and had an illuminating conversation with him. The official was anxious to justify what he had done. He assured me that he was no bigot, but on the contrary, an extremely liberal man, a Unitarian, a progressive, etc. But Mr. Sinclair, he said, I assure you, this prisoner is not a reformer or humanitarian or anything like that. He is a depraved person. Look, here is something we found in his trunk when we arrested him, a pamphlet explaining about sex relations. See this paragraph? It says that the pleasure of intercourse is increased if it is prolonged. I looked at the pamphlet, and then I looked at the attorney. "'Do you think you have stated the matter quite fairly?' I asked. "'Apparently, the purpose is to explain that the emotions of women are more slow to be aroused than those of men, and that husbands, failing to realize this, often do not gratify their wives.' "'Well,' said the other, "'do you consider that a subject to be discussed?' "'Pardon me if I discuss it just a moment,' I replied. Do you happen to know whether this statement is a fact? No, I don't. It may be, I suppose. You have never investigated the matter? The legal representative of our government was evidently annoyed by my persistence. I have not, he answered. But then, suppose I were to tell you that thousands of homes have been broken up for lack of just that bit of knowledge that tens of thousands of marriages are miserable for lack of it. Surely, Mr. Sinclair, you exaggerate. Not at all. I could prove to you by one medical authority after another that if the desire of the woman in marriage is roused, and then left ungratified, the result is nervous strain, and in the long run it may be nervous breakdown. The above covers only one detail of the pamphlet in question. I read some pages of it, and argued them out with the attorney. It was a perfectly simple, straightforward exposition of facts about the physiology of sex, and one of the reasons a man was to be sent to jail for several years was not that he had circulated such a pamphlet, not that he had showed it to young people, but merely that he had it in his trunk. There is an honest and very useful book, written by an English physician, Dr. Marie C. Stopes, entitled Married Love, published by Dr. William J. Robinson of New York, a specialist of authority and integrity. The book deals with just such vital facts in a perfectly dignified and straightforward manner, yet Dr. Robinson has been hounded by the post office department because of it. He was convicted and forced to pay a fine of $250, and the book was barred from the mails. I have so much else of importance to say in this book of love that it would not be sensible to jeopardize it by causing a controversy with our official censors of knowledge. Therefore, I will merely say in general terms that men and women differ, not merely as a sex, but as individuals, and every marriage is a separate problem. Every couple has to solve it in the intimacy of their love life, and for this there are needed, first of all, gentleness on the part of the man, especially in the first days of the honeymoon, and on the part of both at all times, consideration for each other's welfare and enjoyment, and above all, frankness and honesty in talking out the subject. Reticence and shyness may be virtues elsewhere, but they have no place in the intimacies of the sex life. If men and women will only ask and answer frankly, they can find out by experience what makes the other happy, and what causes pain. 
we are dealing here with the most sacred intimacy of life and one of the most vital parts of life's problems it is here in the marriage bed that the divorce problem is to be settled and likewise the problem of prostitution for it is when men and women fail to understand each other and to gratify each other that one or the other turns cold and indifferent perhaps angry and hateful and then we have passions unsatisfied and ranging the world breaking up other homes and spreading disease so i would say to every young couple seek knowledge on this subject seek it without shame from others who have had a chance to acquire it seek it also from nature our wise old mother who knows so much about her children be natural be simple and straightforward and beware of fool notions about sex if you will look in the code of hammurabi which is over four thousand years old you will see the provision that a man who has intercourse with a menstruating woman shall be killed in leviticus you will read that both the man and the women are to be cast out from their people you will find that most people still have some such notion which is without any basis whatever in health and this is only one illustration of many i might give of ignorance and superstition in the sex life i would give this as one very good rule to bear in mind your love exists for the happiness and health of yourself and your partner and not for hammurabi nor moses nor jehovah nor your mother-in-law nor anybody else on the earth or above it great numbers of people believe that women are naturally less passionate than men and that marital happiness depends upon men's recognizing this of course there are defective individuals both men and women but the normal woman is every bit as passionate as a man if once she has been taught and if love is given its proper place in life and monkish notions not allowed to interfere she will remain so all through life in spite of childbearing or anything else i say to married couples that they should devote themselves to making and preserving passionate gratification in love because this is the bright jewel in the crown of marriage and if lovers solve this problem they will find other problems comparatively simple 